We are back in our series called The Story of God. If you've been with us from the beginning, back in September, we started this series looking at the book of Genesis and then the book of Exodus, and we are going to continue this right on until the summer series. Uh, took a little break last week for a very important reason, but now we're back into the series. And if you've been with us, you might remember where we left off is that the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, have been delivered out of slavery in Egypt. The Passover and then the Exodus. Those two events combined, the, the, Passover, the Passover lamb, the angel of death passing over, and then following that, God delivering them by walking on dry ground through the Red Sea and bringing them out. The Exodus, that, that part of the Old Testament, the Exodus, most scholars will tell you that's the central event, creation, of course, and then the history of God's people. The Exodus is the central event of the Old Testament, which Jesus comes to fulfill in the true Exodus, liberating us from the bondage we are in and to sin and death. If that's the central event, and I believe it is, then I would suggest that the, what we're going to look at this morning is a close second. The giving of the law is the, is the other central event of the Old Testament, and very important for us. Now, when we say giving of the law, what do we mean? The phrase law is used in different ways and to refer to several different things which all overlap in different ways. Perhaps you've heard Jesus use the phrase the law and the prophets in the New Testament. What's he mean by that? Law in general refers to all of the commands of God given in scripture, specifically the Old Testament. But properly, most people refer to the law when they talk about the Old Testament as the law, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. And then more specifically than that, the center of the law is the Ten Commandments, the, the sort of the anchor, the foundation, the centerpiece, if you will, of the law. It might be helpful for us to think about the law or the Ten Commandments in this way, like the U.S. Constitution. This is not a perfect analogy, I'll grant you, but our, our society is based on the U.S. Constitution. We have other laws besides the Constitution, don't we? And in fact, the next seven or eight chapters, there's a lot more laws that God gives, a lot more specific laws. But the foundation of them are the Ten Commandments. And when an appeal is made about a particular law at the federal level that goes up to the Supreme Court in our country, the Supreme Court is supposed to evaluate that based on what? I'm not saying they always do this, but they're supposed to evaluate based on the Constitution. That's what they fall back to. In a way, to the Jews, God's people, the Ten Commandments function this way. The foundation, the centerpiece of their life together with God. So a little pop quiz here. How many of you, how many of the Ten Commandments can you name? Can anybody name them all, no problem? Turn to your neighbor and see how many you can name. <laughs> Thou shalt always, uh, never, sometimes. <laughs> Recent surveys tell us that of Christians in America, those who self-identify as church-going Christians, 70% or more can name, can, can't even name five of the Ten Commandments. Who can name the first one? Thou shalt, <laughs> yes, right, have no other gods before me. Keep God, God, in other words. Let's get that one right, and it's first for a reason. How about a different question in our pop quiz? How many of the Ten Commandments have you broken this week? <laughs> Why would we laugh at that? Right? <laughs> How about this? Are you better at naming them or obeying them? Most of us would say naming. And we can't even name all of them, some of us. The, the, the center of God's law is a very serious and important thing. And it's what we want to talk about here. Let's, uh, Ted Turner, the great theologian, said that uh, the Ten Commandments are obsolete today. We're basing our society. Shouldn't be in the, in the courtrooms. Take it down. It's obsolete because... Nobody likes to be commanded to do anything. Commandments are out. Well, I think he's wrong that they're obsolete. But he's quite right that nobody likes to be commanded. Let's look at these, shall we? In Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 21. God giving his law to his people through Moses. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will, will not hold him guiltless 
who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the, Sabbath, the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything else that is your neighbor's. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. And they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. This is a mysterious passage, a powerful passage. Most of people hear this passage read and they think, another set of religious, religious rules, things we have to live up to, another set of standards or rules to keep, laws to obey in order to be in right standing with God. And I can understand that. But when we read it in its context, it's part of a story. It's not bullet points. It's the story of God giving his law to his people. And for the Israelites... And for the Jews today, the law was not initially this set of laws that, that are impossible to keep or measure up to. It was a symbol of God's presence with his people. It was a way of God showing favor to his people. It made them, in a sense, unique. Psalm 147, verses 19 and 20. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. Praise the Lord. Israelites saw themselves as utterly unique, favored by God, that he would give to them his law. He would reveal to them his word. It's how to be in right relationship with God. The pagan nations that surrounded Israel, first, of course, Egypt, the pagan empire that they were enslaved by, and then as they wandered in the wilderness and the desert for 40 years, and then even as they come into the promised land, they're surrounded by nations who worship false gods. And those nations, how many of you read Greek mythology when you were younger, maybe even still? The Greek gods, right, pagan gods, this is much later than this time, but the Greek gods are rather capricious and unpredictable, aren't they? You never quite knew where you stood, and they might zap you at any moment. That's the pagan notion of gods. You must placate them and do the right things to honor them and hope that they would favor you, but you never exactly know where you stand with those gods. The God of Israel, our God, says, I'm different I reveal myself to you by name, Yahweh, and I reveal myself to you by the giving of my law, which means you can know exactly how to relate to me. No guesswork. I want to show you exactly how to be right with me, how to be in right relationship with me. This was utterly unique in the ancient world. Let's look then at the reason for the law. The reason that God gave his law to his people in this way. God's law is God's self-revelation to his people. It's a pretty dramatic story if you think about it. Moses on the mountain, smoke and thunder and lightning, and God himself inscribing his law on stones, on tablets of stone. Why did he do it this way? Well, if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 22 through 24, these words the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain out of the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness with a loud voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. And as soon as you heard the voice out of the midst of darkness while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and greatness. And we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. This day we have seen God speak with man, and man still live. The primary reason that God gave his law to his people, and he gives it still, is to reveal his glory. To show us his glory. His character and his nature are contained in the law. This is why David can write Psalm 119. If you've never read Psalm 119, you know what? Psalm 119, the longest chapter in all the Bible, is essentially a love poem 
to God about his law. If it's just rules, how could he write, I delight in the rules. They are like honey. They drip from my tongue. They're more precious to me than gold. If it's just stuff you have to do. But it's not. David sees it as a revelation of the glory and character of his God. So he can write, I delight in this because in it, I'm delighting in who you are, God. I think for many of us, we miss that. We see it as, oh yeah, I broke that one. I gotta do that. Not as, this is the character of God. This is how I reflect God's character by obedience to his law. The first and foremost thing he gives, the reason he gives his law is that he gives it to us to reveal to us his glory. Now it's fascinating if you were to go through, we wouldn't have time to do this, if you were to go through chapter 20, the first 21 verses, and read the commands, the, the, the laws of God, the Ten Commandments, in contrast with, say, the, the nation of Egypt, where Israel has just come out of captivity. Pharaoh, in Scripture, becomes a symbol of the corruption and evil and injustice of the world. And his law and his kingdom stand in stark contrast with God's law and God's kingdom. For example, the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. Keep God first. He's God, there is no other. Pharaoh says, I am God. I decide, you all bow to me. And there are other lesser gods, but I'm the supreme God. And this is the inclination of the human heart apart from God. You might not say it this way, but to set ourselves up as the captain of our soul and the master of our own fate, as judge and jury over what's right for us, and often, if we're honest, what's right for other people as well. I'm God, and others should bow to me. If you go down the list, then, you see these two commands that kind of go together. Make no graven image, carved image, and don't take my name in vain. Now, when I was a kid, I thought taking the Lord's name in vain was simply don't use bad language, right? That's what I was sort of taught to believe. Don't use the name of the Lord as a, as a bad word. And it's certainly true. We shouldn't do that. But it's deeper than this. Those two put together. In the ancient world, to make a carved image was to set it up and to force people to bow to it. We read this about the story of Daniel and over and over again. Bow down to this image. And in the New Testament, images of Caesar, inscriptions of him, bow down to him. There's a human tendency to set up God and use him for our purposes. I'll use his name. I'll leverage God's name for my gain. I'll make an image that other people will bow to, and I will use it to subjugate them or elevate myself. This is certainly true in Pharaoh's kingdom and in the kingdom of the world. But God says, no, in my kingdom, we don't use, you don't use me for your gain. You surrender yourself to me. And you go right on down the list. Honor your father and mother. Remember the Sabbath day. And you notice the Sabbath day, when God says this, he goes on in a great detail through to Moses and says, not just you, but your children, their servants, even the strangers in your land should all observe this. Why? Well, it'd be no problem for the, for the wealthy and the powerful in society to say, I'll take a break, but the rest of you keep working to earn money for me. The rest of you will not take a break, will not rest. God says, uh, no, all of my people, regardless of their social status, their wealth, their economic status, all of them will rest and remember me. In other words, you go down the list and you see a, a stark contrast between the kingdom of the world and its laws and rules and the kingdom of God and his law. Another reason God gave his law, it found to us in Romans chapter seven, verse seven. What shall we then say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. In other words, the second reason for the law is that it reveals our sinfulness. So first, the law reveals God's character. Second, the law reveals my character as well. And it's not like God's. My sinfulness. And you might think it's strange. Do we really need the, the law to tell us not to do these things? Shouldn't we just know? Actually, no. These Israelites are coming out of uh, captivity, enslavement, surrounded by pagan nations. God is treating them, in a sense, as spiritual toddlers. Here's the rule. Here's what I want you to, don't, you know, my mom used to say to me, Jeffrey, God is happy when we share, you know, and I would say, but I'm not, you know. <laughs> Let me spell it out for you in the plainest of terms. And when Paul says, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet, what he means is, I was already coveting. I was already a lawbreaker, but I was ignorant of this. And the law comes to reveal my spiritual condition, 
to show me my need. Let me give you a crude example. A couple of years ago, I bought a vehicle from my father. My, my parents spend most of the year now in Arizona, and they didn't need one of the cars, and I needed a third car for my children. That's perfect. I bought it from my dad. S- paid him. He signed the title, and I just put the title in an envelope and put it in the glove box and forgot, because I'm forgetful and lazy, to go and have the title transferred. I didn't, so I'm driving the car with an open title. Didn't even think that, that was a big deal. It's actually a felony, by the way. And then, uh, so, his, so, so his insurance is not valid because the car is signed over. It's not his car anymore. And my insurance is not valid because I haven't transferred the title into my name. So I'm driving an uninsured car, also a crime, right? And uh, I didn't, didn't have proper registration. Also, you could get a fine for that as well. And guess what? I got pulled over driving my daughter to basketball practice going 53 and a 45. You know? <laughs> and he said, license and registration and proof of insurance. Uh, well, let me explain, officer. He said, explain what? And he was a bit of a, he was a, bit of a uh, law guy, you know? <laughs> and he revealed to me, uh, you know, you're committing a felony and two misdemeanors here by driving this car. With a... Now, the point is, I was doing that for about two months. But, it, but, but that traffic's violation, that traffic stop, revealed to me my condition. And, you know, he wasn't as gracious as I would have liked him to be, and I had to pay some fines. We laugh at that, but that's, that's the point Paul's making here is, apart from Christ, the condition of every human heart is you are in sin. You are lawbreakers. You're in trouble. And most of us have no idea. We're just driving around thinking we're fine. And the law comes, even though it feels awkward to us and not very kind or good news, it's actually incredibly good news because it says you're in need. You're not right. Let me show you where you're out of bounds. That's why God gives it, to show us that. This sounds harsh to us in our culture. We don't like to think about these days. It's not popular in our culture to say, tell somebody where they're wrong. The law is revealing where, you're, where we're wrong, where we're not like God. And, but in our culture, it's, it's very intolerant and ungracious to say you're wrong here. Now, I am not suggesting that all of you go out from here and start telling everyone you know why they're wrong. But if you're in relationship with somebody, if you love someone, and you see that they're in danger, It's incredibly ungracious to be silent. Which of you, if you saw your spouse or child or grandchild walking out onto a frozen pond that you knew was thin and dangerous because they didn't see the sign, would just say, well, this is interesting. Let's see what happens. Let's see if they fall through and die. You'd scream, get back. Don't go out there. And that would be the most gracious, loving thing you could do. We don't think of the law this way, but that's precisely what's happening here. You're in danger. You're in grave spiritual danger. And it would be unloving for God not to say so, not to show us. Last reason, the giving of the law comes to us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. For since the law was, it has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. The writer of Hebrews is saying this. The law, while it in itself is perfect and reflects the perfect character of God, it cannot make you perfect because you cannot keep it. It is a shadow of the good things to come. Meaning the law was given to reveal God's glory, to reveal our sinfulness, and to point us to the good thing to come, Jesus Christ. That's the third reason for the giving of the law, to point us to Jesus. Because we cannot keep it. Notice in verses 18 through 21 of Exodus 20, we already read these, the smoke and the fire and the lightning and the sound of a trumpet, and then the people say to Moses, listen, you talk to God, and then tell us what he said. We don't want to talk to him. And Moses says, don't be afraid. This is happening that God wants to test you, which is a strange phrase. And then he says this, so that the fear of God might be in you, so you may not sin. Now, in the Bible, we talk often about the fact in 1 John 4 that perfect love casts out fear. There's no fear in love. And the most commonly given command in all of Scripture is do not fear. So how do we reconcile that with these phrases that tell us we should have the fear of the Lord? Parents, you know this, right? You understand this. There's a kind of fear that's unhealthy. It's going to lead to therapy someday. That's paralyzing. That's about judgment and condemnation that is not good and God wants to remove from our hearts. There's another kind of fear which is reverence and respect and awe, which is a good thing. And we need. When I was a 10-year-old boy, I went to spend a summer with my Uncle Jerry in Montana. 
uh, work on his ranch, and my parents thought it'd be good for me. Actually, they probably thought it'd be good for them, too. But anyway, I spent the summer with Uncle Jerry, and if I did all my chores throughout the week, we'd go horseback riding on the weekend, or we'd go, we'd go uh, hunting or fishing together, or we'd go out and do something fun. And I, I remember the first time I rode horses with him, we were going to do an overnight backpacking trip on horseback. And he said to me, now, these are not, uh, these are not the kind of horses you've ridden, Jeff, where they're they're sort of uh, domesticated, and people ride them all day long. These are a little bit wild, and so never, ever walk behind your horse unless you first go to its nose, touch him, and then run your hand along his side so he knows you're there. The horses would get skittish, and you could get hurt if you just walk up behind him. I said, okay. He kind of giving me the rules, if you will. I didn't really listen to those rules very well, and when I was walking with the saddle in my hand to, to, to saddle the horse, I walked right up behind the horse. That horse felt something behind me, and it, boom, and launched me right out of the barn at 10 years old. Broke a rib, knocked me flat on my back. I didn't do that again. I never walked behind that horse again without, I'm I'm here, I'm here. What The the point is, there's there's a healthy respect and reverence and fear that's good for us, spiritually speaking. Not fear of condemnation or judgment or punishment from an unpredictable God, but reverence and awe for who God is, his holiness and his greatness. Let's look now at the ransom from the law. We've already established that the law reveals our sinfulness and our inability to keep it. What then is the solution? The ransom from the law. The law reveals our problem, but it does not in and of itself provide the solution. Just one passage here I want to read from the book of Galatians, which is so remarkable, and try to unpack this as it relates to what the Apostle Paul is saying here. Galatians chapter, 21 through 20, chapter 3, excuse me, verse 21 through 26. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. This is an amazing passage. Paul says, we were imprisoned in sin, under the law. What he means by this is, when the law came, it revealed our law, the fact that we're lawbreakers, and therefore it put us in the category of being a lawbreaker, imprisoned, as it were, in sin. But the law did something else. It served as a guardian for us to point us to our need for reconciliation, for redemption, to be made righteous. And if you're not a regular churchgoer, the word righteous is kind of a churchy word. It simply means to be in right relationship with God. How does that happen? Well, it could happen by keeping the law, but we can't keep it. So how does it happen? The law brings us then to the need for sacrifice to be made on our behalf. And then it says, it's a guardian until Christ came. Becomes our, now when it says guardian, it doesn't mean like military guard. The phrase actually refers to like a custodian of an estate. Legal guardian, legal custodian. of. In other words, you've been given a great inheritance, but you're not ready yet to receive it. And so one is watching over you until such a time as you're ready to receive your full inheritance. That's the better picture of what the Apostle Paul is saying here. You've been given a great inheritance in the grace of Jesus Christ. And when that, when that time comes, the law is no longer needed the way that it was for the same purpose. Because faith in Christ has come. Here's how this works in the life of a Christ follower. This won't be on the screen, but I'll read it uh, for you from Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This is amazing. What the Bible is saying is when you place your trust in Jesus Christ, two things simultaneously happen that Jesus does for you. One is, you're a lawbreaker, and there is a payment for your lawbreaking, and that payment is in Jesus Christ. He pays the penalty of your sin. The second thing, and they're all part of one gift of grace, is this. Not only that, but he's the perfect law keeper. He fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law, and that is placed in you, so that when God looks at you, he doesn't see your lawbreaking, he sees the perfect record of his son. He's given 
you his righteousness, his right standing with God. Are you following this? When you trust Jesus, the payment is made for your law breaking and the perfect record that you can't have on your own is given to you. And not only that, but his resurrection then is, is evidence that he's broken the power of sin and death for not keeping the law and gives you a new possibility for life. That's essentially what it means to become a Christian. And this only happens by faith. There's no hocus pocus or magic words or special oil or things you have to do that would be more law. It simply means I recognize I'm here under the law and I have no power to keep it and I can't make myself right before God. What hope is there for me? The only hope is that Jesus Christ would bring me from law, under the law to under grace and shower me with his grace, give me his perfect record, pay my penalty and liberate me to live a different kind of life. That's the power in and, and, and this Old Testament mysterious passage where God is giving the law and the people tremble. It's as if they know the glory of God and their inability to measure up. The law couldn't do it because we couldn't keep it. Finally, the relevance of the law. If it's true that Christ fulfills the requirement of the law and if he pays your penalty for breaking it, then what's the point of it? Why do we need it? And believe it or not, there are some people in the church today who would say, well, we don't need it, actually. We shouldn't, don't worry about it. It's all by grace. Throw the law out and just, you know, just be generally, generally a good person and trust Jesus. I don't believe that's what the Bible teaches. Jesus himself said, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Every letter, that the smallest letter or the least stroke of a pen will disappear until everything is accomplished. He did not come to cast it. It's not as if God said, I gave him my law and nobody could keep it. Well, that didn't really work out so well, so scrap that and let's do the grace thing. That's, some people think that way. That's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, Jesus was once asked a question about the relevance of the law in Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. This is an amazing statement. Is he saying, we don't need ten, we only need two? Is that what Jesus is saying? No, he's saying these are what the ten and all of them come down to. Love. It all boils down to love for God and love for people. And if you think about the Ten Commandments themselves, what are the first four about? You shall have no other God before me. You shall not take my name in vain. You shall have, make no carved images. You shall remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What are these all about? Our love for God. Our vertical relationship. These are ways that we show covenant loyalty to God. Express our love for him by keeping him first in our hearts, our only God, the only one we offer our worship to. No person, no thing, no position, only God. That we would never ever use his name or his image for our gain, we surrender our lives to him. And that we would put patterns in our lives weekly and daily to remember him. That's loving him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, what, is, what are five through 10 about? The next six commandments. Honor your father and mother. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't covet, right? What are these about? How we love each other. How we express divine love to one another. The boundaries for that. That's why Jesus says, if you want to break it down, love God and love people. That's what the center of the law is really all about. He's not saying we don't need these things anymore. He's saying this is the way we show love. In fact, in John 14, verse 15, what does Jesus say? If you love me, you will... Keep my commandments. You'll obey me. Now notice he does not say, if you want me to love you, you will keep my commandments. And most of us get that wrong in our hearts, even if not with our mouths. We think, yes, yes, God is pleased with me when I obey him, and therefore that means he loves me. Of course he's pleased when you obey him, but he doesn't love you any less when you disobey. If you're in Christ, if you're under grace, you're loved infinitely and perfectly. In other words, it's not I obey so that he'll, I'll be over here. It's I'm, I've been brought from under the law, under death, to life and grace, and therefore I want to love God, and this is how I do it, by obeying him. That's why he gave it. This is how you love me, 
by, by obeying me and loving each other. But so many of us get this wrong. The prophet Jeremiah, writing before the coming of Jesus, of course, looking forward to a day when the law would be different than just on stone tablets, says these remarkable words in Jeremiah 31, verse 33. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. What an incredible promise. God looking forward to this day saying, how was the law first given, first written? Stone tablets, smoke, fire, lightning, fear, trembling. The prophet is saying, there's coming a day when it won't be on stone tablets, it'll be on your heart. It'll be in your heart. It'll be welling up out of a heart of love for God and for people. Not an external uh, rule that you have to live up to that could crush you if you can't keep it. But inside of you, a growing desire to love God and to love other people. This is what God is after. Remember the fruit of the Spirit, right, in Galatians 5? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then the next line is, against such things there is no law. Isn't that curious? There's no, what does he mean? There's no law against love, joy, peace. Moms and dads, you know this. Can you say to your children, you will be joyful. That's a law in this house, right? You will be patient. You can say it, but does that work? If you have a resentful or impatient child, all they're doing is putting on a good face, if that, right? And, and the truth is, whether you're a, a two-year-old toddler kicking and screaming in the, in the Walmart aisle because you're not getting your way, or you're a teenager, adolescent, more resentful and bitter inside, but outwardly complying, it's still a heart problem, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control come from within. The law written on our hearts, the law placed inside of us, welling up in us out of because of the grace of Jesus Christ that we want to live this way. There's no law that can require that. There's no law that can make you a transformed person. That's what the Apostle Paul means. The law cannot make you perfect. Only Jesus can do that. The perfect law keeper. Last verse for you. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Such a simple sentence, but so much power for our lives. For sin shall not have dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. If you need a highlighter, underliner, you should write that one down, underline it, star it, circle it, exclamation point it. Think about that. Because of Jesus Christ, sin d- does not have power under you. Why? Because you're not over here. You're not over here under the crushing weight of the law that you can't keep. You're under grace. You've been set free. You've been liberated. To do what? To surrender your life in loving obedience to the God who saved you. Isn't that beautiful? And so, I think, so people over here on Law Road, there's two categories. Some of you don't yet know the grace of Jesus Christ. You're imprisoned in sin, held captive by the law. You don't yet recognize your need. But for many of us, We're believers in Christ. We've been brought under grace. But the pull of our heart is to inch back this way, isn't it? To sneak back this way like those people aren't, how could they act that way or vote that way or do these things and call themselves Christians? And we're we're fundamental legalists at heart. We like it over here. And Jesus is saying, I liberated you from that. This is the most exhausting place to live. Never knowing if you're quite good enough. Always striving to be good enough. And never quite knowing, have I done enough with the vague background noise in your soul that you're not right. And measuring yourself by other people. I'm better than that guy. I'm pretty good when I look at all of you. God doesn't grade on the curve. He he grades on the basis of perfection. And you can receive that in Christ and come out from under this exhausting way to live and be brought under grace. That's, that's the, what God wants to write over your life. Grace, grace. It's all grace. And then when that gets inside of you, you want to be a law keeper. Not have to. Not to earn his love. I have it in abundance. But I want to love him in return. So I'll ask you this question. I've gone long enough. Where are you standing today? Where are, where, where are you standing in your heart? Over here? Are you tired? Wondering if you're good enough on law road? Or are you under grace? 
Jesus says, come out from underneath the law. Let me write it on your heart and bring you under my grace. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace, your amazing, incredible, life-changing grace. We also praise you for your law, which though we cannot keep, it reveals our deep need for what you have given us in Jesus Christ. How we thank you, we praise you in his glorious name. Amen. I just love listening to Ryan lead us in that song. I forgot to mention this earlier, but if you're here this morning and you've come prepared to give to our benevolent offering, ushers will receive that as you leave. And just to remind you, those monies go directly to meet the needs of people inside our church and in our community who are hurting and in need, and we thank you for your generosity in advance. And of course, if you would like someone to pray with you, feel free to come forward at the close of the service. Members of the prayer team will be down front. Now, brothers and sisters, go in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who brings you out from under the law to live under the freedom of his grace. To him be glory and honor Amen, and go in peace.